Uh, let's talk about Akamai a little bit. How did the idea of Akamai come to be, and what, what is actually Akamai all about? In a few words. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, well, Akamai is a company that delivers and accelerates web content. Uh, we carry about 250,000 websites, and uh, we place servers, computer servers, all around the world. So we have about 100,000 servers in thousands of locations um, in 650 cities inside a thousand different networks. And the way it works is when you go to a popular website that's probably an Akamai customer, your browser is actually connecting to an Akamai server that's very near you. Uh, we have Akamai servers in several locations in Haifa. Uh, we're not on the campus here at the Technion yet, but I hope we'll change that. Right. Uh, and that'll make the performance be even better because the content you want is now going to be closer to you. And that makes it be faster. Uh, and we can also make it be more secure uh, by sort of blocking out the bad guys who are trying to bring down websites or trying to corrupt the content. Your interaction is just local, just here in this city and in, in the Last Mile Network. We got started uh, at MIT. Uh, Danny Lewin graduated from the Technion and then came to MIT and was my student there. Uh, just a fantastic uh, person, very smart, very driven and hardworking, and uh, came up with some really great ideas uh, in a theoretical context, a mathematics context mm -hmm. at MIT, about how to distribute web content, how to do load balancing in a much better way, uh, how to do you know, routing around problems in the internet. Uh, really fantastic stuff. And, uh, you know, we didn't really have an intention of forming a company. We were doing this sort of basic research. We published it. We tried to get companies to use it, um, but they didn't. Uh, and it was because of a student business plan competition at MIT that uh, we entered, really mostly to learn about how to write a business plan. No intention of forming a company, but through the process, the year long process of this competition, we learned about forming a company, and ultimately, when we couldn't get anybody to use the technology, we decided the only way to get it out there and make it be useful is to do it ourselves. So we incorporated Akamai in uh, the late summer of 1998. Long-winded answer to a short question, <laughs> no, sorry. That's, that's <laughs> fine. I'm, I'm curious a little bit about the mechanism. As I was reading a little bit about Akamai last night, preparing for the interview, I was thinking I used to work for a very small company called on it managed many years ago. Its claim to fame was that it, it implemented a TCP IP stack, which was a very common Unix concept. It implemented that for the PCs, and this is way back when, when nobody thought about the internet. And I was trying to understand the, the concept of Akamai, again, on a very shallow level. Um, and I was thinking that it resembles the idea of mirroring that you do on Unix, where you have you know, when I worked for Intel and I was producing data, I always had to mirror it for my peers over in Santa Clara. So did you, in a way, implement, did you find a good niche to implement something, a concept, in the right place at the right time? Would you say that was the thing? Yeah, uh, mirroring existed, you know, of course, before Akamai. And the idea is you keep content other places so uh, people can get access to it and you can load balance. Uh, you know, we took that up step farther uh, in terms of being, you know, having the capability to have multiple copies of content in lots of places for the web and to make the access to that content be very easy and really transparent right. uh, to the end user. Um, and then on top of that, built in very sophisticated load balancing and our own routing algorithms, you know, for the, that we use on top of the internet, our own communication protocols. Uh, our own application layer capabilities to make uh, applications run faster even if you can't mirror anything, even if you can't cache anything somewhere else, we'll still make that app run a lot faster. So ultimately what we've done is, is build our own virtual internet on top of the real internet. And because we control our servers, we can do all our own protocols to make them really work the way that you'd have hoped the internet would have been built to work wasn't and never really will change, I think. So, um, so it started with something like mirroring, but making it really work in the web context, and then a whole lot more built on top of it. 
So in, in this context of, of my vested interest here of, of uh, academia, industry relationship, and, and having Akamai grow out of pure research idea, how do you see this, this very delicate dance between academia and, and industry? Taking ideas, moving them into, making them profitable, or, t or bringing a company into the academia surrounding and having research nurture off of some very seedling ideas. How do you see that relationship working? I think it's uh, very powerful and very productive, but seems to have a lot of challenges and barriers. Um, you know, at the high level, technology transfer, I think, is always a challenge. You know, one rule of thumb is it takes 20 years for acad purely academic work to become pervasive in industry. Uh, I think with Akamai, that time period was much shorter. Mm. Um, you know, we did the research starting in 90, we started in 95, Danny came in 96, did really fantastic stuff. You know, and so the research is in the 90s, and it was pretty pervasively used in the Akamai platform, you know, in the early 2000s. You know, and so we cut down the 20 years, but we didn't follow the typical path. You know, we were the academics that created the company and then drove the company. And so I think that's what made the time period be a lot, lot less than the 20 years. It's very hard, I think, when academics, you know, throw it over the wall or throw it out there in the published papers or in patents, it takes a long time for it to get picked up and then to really be used in products and then for those products to become pervasive. The more we can bring industry close to academics and make the barriers below to the technology transfer, I, I think the better it is. Um, so I'm, I'm a huge believer that that's really important to do. And it's always surprising how hard it is to accomplish. And um, how did the Akamai fare that um, bubble burst of 2001 with 9-11 and losing a major contributor to the company, well, a friend and a colleague? I yeah, presume. Danny Lewin, uh, you know, his death was a terrible tragedy. You know, he was not just my you know colleague and co-founder, but my best friend. You know, uh, it was just horrible. Uh, he was a you know fantastic human being. Um, you know, he, he, not only was he brilliant, but he was a nice guy, and he was very driven. You know, he, captain in the IDF. Uh, I found out later after he died that he was even Mr. Teen Israel. You know, so here's a guy that you know just has about everything you can imagine in one you know person, person. Uh, tremendous leader, and uh, so losing Danny was you know really terrible. Um, the company that was a big blow to the company, obviously. Uh, you know, people really, you know, doubled down. I think when that happened at the company, uh, because everybody loved Danny and, and respected him. Um, you know, and they wanted to, I think, help fulfill his legacy. That day was a uh, super challenging day for the company aside from you know dealing with the loss of Danny right. but the US government websites came under attack right. um, and there were natural large volumes of traffic that day because uh, people wanted to know what's going on oh, and uh, they all went down and they came to Akamai to get back online and so here you have a situation where you know we're dealing with the emotional situation but we have a huge amount of work to do to get you know the major web, FBI and major websites back online, and so at the end of the day, it was a, a great proof point for Akamai that we what we'd always been saying and Danny had always been saying came true really that day. We proved it uh, in being able to deal with the attacks and the and the crowds of people wanting to reach those sites. Uh, the that time period as a whole was very difficult because the bubble burst. Mm -hmm. uh, so the company went from being worth 35 billion, which is a pretty wild number back then, uh, to less than $100 million. We were worth less than our debt. Mm -hmm. um, our customers were going broke in droves. Uh, the cash was running out. We had to lay off two thirds of the company. Uh, we had to get out of a lot of real estate commitments. Uh, we had, you know, we were counting the time to live in months in terms of cash flow. Um, so, we had to work really hard to get through all that and to keep the company keep the company whole uh, and then to grow it to become profitable. 
which we managed to do in the 2003-2004 time frame. So you did bounce back eventually? We did. It, you know, it, we just was tremendous perseverance, I think. We, we, we had great technology, we had great people, and it was the perseverance to, you know, not give in. Everybody had left us for dead on the outside. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we believed we could do it, we believed in what we had, we believed in our people, and we just kept after it. Um, and it, you know, it, it proved out to be, to be correct. You know, today, uh, Akamai is a very successful company, you know, still growing at a pretty good rate. Um, and we're generating hundreds of millions of dollars of cash a year, over a billion dollars in revenue. Uh, and just at the beginning, really, even though we've been in business now a long time, there's so many new challenges for the future on the internet. And we're right in the middle of it, which That's, is exciting. I was just about to ask you, what are the challenges that you're facing now? And what's, what's in the future? Because the, the internet is changing. You were talking about the handheld devices. And streaming is a whole big thing. So there's a lot of new stuff going on. How, how are you facing these challenges? Yeah, it's exciting. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you think about the internet and, it's, well, it's been here a long time. And, you know, you might think that, hey, it's, it's happened. We look at it, it's, it's just in the infancy. You know, you think about, say, video. There's about 1%, maybe 2 of all video watching is done over the Internet. That's tiny. Um, huge market there. Yeah, huge potential. <laughs> and it will explode. You know, it's growing rapidly already, but I, I think there will be some threshold, maybe the right device in the home. I don't know. Maybe, who knows, maybe it's Apple, maybe it's somebody else builds the right thing for movie viewing in the home that makes it explode. You look at the connected de devices, you know, with the m proliferation of mobile devices now, it's, it's just everything is being connected. Um, yeah, you can wear things on your body that send your biometrics online. Right. Your cars are online. You can actually take control of somebody's car. Now, the bad guys can take control of your car now through the Internet. It's uh, remarkable. You know, the QR codes, even things that aren't electronic, you can slap a QR code on and, you know, right. connect it that way. Uh, that's... Mobile is changing everything again. Uh, you look at enterprise, hmm. you know, and the enterprise applications now moving into the cloud. Uh, right. the, you know, the, the behind the firewall notion is changing into the hybrid cloud as applications move into somebody else's data center or you get software as a service. And that's right. changing how enterprises work. Uh, commerce is moving online at, mm -hmm. you know, very fast rate. Uh, you know, and you think, then you think about all the social uses, you know, Facebook, you know, and oh, yeah. what's the next one, you know, it's, uh, and who knows really, it's just, it is so much potential, uh, I think the change is, is really just beginning, which is exciting, it creates technical challenges and opportunities for the business. And you're right there. Yes. Security, another huge one, right? right? I was going to ask you about just that. The, Very the cyber deal. attacks are going through the roof. Uh, which is changing our business again. It's our fastest growing area of our business today. That's great. So that leads us to the next question then. How did you come to Israel and why Pretendo? Well, uh, you know, uh, I'm here today because uh, we recently closed an acquisition of Katendo, which is an Israeli company. Uh, and they have an R&D center here. And they're doing some very exciting work. Uh, it's great to be here at the Technion, you know, where Danny, you know, came from. And uh, we're growing the Israeli office. It's going to be doing uh, our basing our work in security development will be done here and security research, as well as key parts of our server uh, development. The server is what delivers all the content. It's the most important you know, collection of code that we have, and there's great expertise here for doing that. So we're starting with a great team with Katendo, but now we're going to grow that team. And uh, oh, so we'd great. like to, you know, do that. And we're recruiting summer interns and uh, full-time employees uh, to, to work for Akamai. It's, it's a long overdue thing. And I remember talking to Danny in the very early days. In fact, we looked at, you know, acquisitions then and, and setting up an office here then. Uh, and, you know, that didn't end up happening. And so it's long overdue. But it's, I think, really important for us to be here. I think this probably won't be the last acquisition we do in Israel, and that now that we have uh, people here on the ground, it becomes much easier for us to do other acquisitions and to grow. So have you been following the Israeli high-tech industry, and, and do you have any thoughts about how well-evolved it is, or where can it go? 
and, and the perspective of a U.S. company? Yeah, it's a uh, you know, very vibrant technology community here. A uh, lot of creative ideas, startups you know, here that are, you know, they're, they're the lifeblood, I think, of you know, as a company gets bigger to make acquisitions there, to recruit there. We've already done some recruiting here uh, in terms of individual people that we know were very good that we wanted you know, to have with Akamai. Uh, now that we have an office here, that becomes a lot easier to do. Uh, and you know, we've looked at other companies here already. We haven't you know, uh, finished anything, uh, but I think it's a great place you know, for us to grow. We were, we were talking you know, with the team here that we'd like this to become our best R&D center. You know, we run large centers today in, in uh, the Boston area and in Silicon Valley and in Bangalore. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a small one now in Ottawa through an acquisition. Uh, but there's, and we are saying there's no reason that uh, the goal should be to make it be our best R&D center for the company, because uh, there's great, great talent here. And I'm hoping a lot of it will come out of Technion graduates. Who are that would be great. No, they got <laughs> the best folks here. That would be wonderful to do. Yeah. Are you familiar with the with the Technion atmosphere at all? Uh, have oh, you yeah. ever been to the Technion? I had not been to the Technion before, before but I, uh, I am familiar with it. It's similar to an MIT culture. Um, and uh, which I'm very familiar with. I've worked with lots of folks, you know, in my uh, you know academic career. Right. Um, well, from Israel, of course, but also specifically from the Technion. So I'm very familiar with the culture and the uh, the high level of capability here. So you mentioned you haven't been to the Technion. Have you been to Israel before? Yes, I've visited. It's been a while, but I visited Israel before at a uh, academic conference and. You know, had the chance to do some touring. Uh, my wife has uh, relatives that live here, uh, so uh, even though haven't been here recently, I expect I'll be coming a lot more in the future. Yeah, we hope so. You have to come often now that you have a company here. Any uh, words of wisdom to Technion students who are thinking about becoming entrepreneurs or contemplating academic career versus a career in industry? And what's, what's the right thing to do? <laughs> you know, they're all right things to do. There's no one right thing to do. Uh, if you like academics, great. You know, pursue that. If you like industry, that's, that's very good to do. And, you know, if you have an idea, you know, and you're interested in entrepreneurship, I think that's a fantastic thing. You know, I never thought of myself as becoming an entrepreneur or starting a company. You know, and part of it is you just don't know what the future holds. Um, but that there will be opportunities, especially for kids coming out of the Technion, because they're well trained, they're smart, they're going to have opportunities, and to take advantage of the opportunities when they come. And uh, don't let people tell you that it's a, a bad idea. You know, decide for yourself, you know, and don't let them tell you it can't work. You know, you got to make that decision yourself and then, you know, follow what you believe in. That's great. Thank you. Okay, I thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah.